Hi everyone. This is the second part, second section of our chapter on deviance crime and social control. Here we'll look at um, th three major theoretical perspectives in sociology and um, apply them to understanding uh, deviance and crime. These theories are uh, functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. I highly recommend uh, that you would review the previous chapters in which we already covered the basic of these theories. So bio biologists, psychologists, and sociologists have different perspectives on why people violate norms. Uh, so for biologists, um, um, they, in explaining, you know, um, the source of uh, crime and deviance, they often focus on genetic predisposition, uh, including factors such as intelligence, the XYY theory in which uh, it theorizes that an extra Y chromosome in men uh, is responsible for aggression and higher crime among these, among these men, or they might uh, uh, focus on body types such, such as squarish, muscular persons more are more likely to commit street crimes. Psychological explanations, on the other hand, focus on personality, personality disorders such as bad toilet training, uh, or with the, what that refers to as bad relationship with uh, parents when they were young, having a suffocating mothers, and so on. Uh, yet these uh, psychological explanations do not necessarily result in the presence or absence of specific forms of deviance in a person. Sociobiologists, like biologists and uh, psychologists, explain deviance by looking within individuals. They focus on biological factors and, uh, and how society influences them. Sociological explanations um, search outside the individual to understand the source of crime and deviance. Crime, uh, according to sociolo sociologists, crime is a violation of norms written into law, and each society has its own laws against certain types of behavior, but social influences such as socialization, subcultural group memberships, or social class may recruit uh, some people to break norms. So this, so what I just explained to you about sociological explanation of crime is really referencing the sociological imaginations that we already covered in previous chapters. So I highly recommend you to review it if necessary. So this is uh, an image um, that I drew for you in an attempt to explain how sociologists see the individual as part of society, but you know, he or she is part of the, indiv the individual, but that they're also part of small groups, that in turn also part of institutions, and then all that's part of society. And what connects all these elements are social forces, uh, as well as values, norms, and social structure that uh, penetrate across all these levels of membership. So theoretical perspective. And uh, again, uh, I highly recommend you to preview, uh, to review previous chapters. We already covered this already, but I want to qu very, very quickly talk about this again uh, so that we, we can move forward with the rest of our chapter. So functionalism, which is one of sociolog major sociological theories, look at um, society as a human body it's made out of uh, imagine the body is uh, you know we need all different parts to work together and you know to cooperate you know if uh, so think of our body as each part of our body is representing different institutions of society now if one institution or one part of our body is broken um, the whole body or the society is not as fully functional anymore so all these parts you know of our society or our body need to work together in order and they rely on each other and this reliance is built on trust and bonds okay. conflict theory on the other hand 
um, argues that you know society is set up like a league table in which there's a lot of competition and conflict uh, conflicts for limited resources. In particular, everyone wants to be number one, being on top. And, um, you know, that's uh, the position in which you have the most privilege, power, and prestige. Uh, but not everyone can be on there. So, according to conflict theory, society, you know, is made of a conflicts and struggle for power. SI, one of the third major sociological perspective, emphasize symbols and their different meanings uh, and how they define and coordinate relationships uh, in our society. So here's a table sum, uh, summarizing these three sociological theories for you. And again, uh, if you are still puzzled, confused, or need to review these theories, I recommend that you look at the lecture videos and readings in the previous chapter, particularly the first chapter. <coughs> so now let's apply these uh, sociological theories to understand deviance and how and why it occurs. Let's start out functionism. Sociologists who follow the functionalist approach are concerned with the way the different elements of society contribute to the whole. They view deviance as a key component of a functioning society. So strain theory, social disorganization theory, and cultural uh, deviance theory represent three functionalist perspectives on deviance in society. So functionalism, the, you know, starting with Durkheim's theory about the essential nature of deviance. He argues that deviance has functions that, is, that and so it is necessary for a successful society the, the functions of deviance include uh, challenging people's present view, uh, clarifying uh, or reaffirming currently held social norms, and promoting social unity uh, by reacting to deviance, group members develop a we feeling and collectively affirm the rightness of their own way. Another functionalist uh, theories of, on um, deviance is strain theory, uh, which was uh, developed by sociologists by the name uh, Merton, Robert Merton. So Robert Mern tried wanted to understand, uh, you know, how access to social socially acceptable goals plays a part in determining whether a person conforms or deviates. So he wants. To, so most of us are socialized to, for example, follow the American dream, to have a big home to have a lot of money, to be famous, to be loved, uh, and, and so on. And so the institutional, the nor, uh, means are usually, for example, going to school, going to work, save money, uh, work hard, and then we will achieve those uh, cultural goals. So the most common reactions to cultural goals and institutional means is conformity. That means that we, the most common reaction is that we would use lawful means in order to uh, seek the goals that society set for us. And no me, however, prefer to the strain that people experience when they're blocked in their attempts to achieve these goals. So this is, so they, they feel a strain because they cannot achieve the goals uh, that everyone wants, and that could be because they don't have access to um, the institutional means, for example. Okay. So, Merton's uh, strain theory aims to analyze what happens when people are socialized to desire cultural goals, but denied the institutional means to reach them. So, here is a table to help you uh, kind of keep track of uh, and understand uh, his theory. So, 
most if people conform uh, to adaptation then they do not face uh, they don't have they don't feel the strain or or that leads to a me. so that means they accept cultural goals and the institutional needs so that means for example they accept that uh, in order to have a big home uh, they need to work hard and uh, go to school get a degree uh, and be promoted and have make more money in order to buy that home so that would be conformity however there are people who have deviant tasks and uh, and therefore deviant responses to a know me okay. yeah and So I want to clarify that uh, they adopt deviant paths because they feel strain that leads to a no me. Okay? So these deviant paths include innovation. So innovation is uh, they accept cultural goals, but they reject institutional means. So they innovatively use legitimate means to achieve the cultural goals. For example, selling drugs to have money to buy ex expensive luxury cars and big mansion. A second deviant path is ritualism, which is uh, giving up on achieving cultural goals, but clinging on conventional rules of conduct uh, or the institutional means, such as, for example, an artist who who doesn't care about money, status, and prestige, and yet still go to school and work like everyone else who conform. And he or she often may not be very happy at the job at work, but he or she is still, still do it. Okay. A third deviant path is retreatism. This is when the individual rejects cultural goals, such as uh, and dropping out from society, such as monks, nuns, and nieces. And and uh, and priest. Four deviant paths is rebellion, and these individuals seek to replace society's goals, such as hippies, activists, terrorists, freedom fighters. So, according to strain theory, deviants are not pathogenic individuals, but they are products of our society, and uh, and part of this is that they feel strained, and you know, the inability to meet the cultural goals. Uh, and that's why uh, they they adapted uh, and, and followed these deviant paths. Here I've included a uh, a video clip from the wire that show you how um, these two individuals, Avon and Stranger, the, these two characters uh, in um, this video clip. Um, exemplify Mern's strain theory. So in this it's just to gives you a context. So the gang leader Avon Barksdale and Stranger Bell debate how they can reclaim their top real estate for selling heroin. Avon states that how he is a gangster or from Merton's perspective an innovator. In contrast, Stranger Bell pushes to work with Marlowe, another gangster not shown in these scenes, and eventually uh, Str Stranger uh, he eventually desists from the drug trafficking scene, so making straight money as a conformist. Here is a second clip uh, 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 from The Wire that also exemplifies strain theory. Um, and here, the second clip, jo the two characters, Johnny and Bubbles, um, they both are drug users. They d in, this video, in this clip, they debate how to make money. With Bubbles wanting to get paid helping the police, thus working toward being a conformist. But Johnny ultimately convinces Bubbles to help him own innovate through petty crimes simply to feed his addiction, So, uh, such as becoming a retreatist. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, move on to the second, uh, second uh, theory, a uh, second functionalist theory called illegitimate opportunity structure uh, theory, uh, which was concept was developed by sociologists Richard Howard and Lloyd Olin. And uh, they developed this, uh, they 
We're trying to understand how different social classes have di distinct styles of crimes due to differential access to institutionalized means. And so, in they suggest that these differences are due to differential access to in institutionalized means. That illusionary opportunity structures. Uh, which is their theory, uh, are opportunities for crimes such as robbery, burglary, or drug dealing that are woven into the texture of life. These structures may result in legitimate structures fail. I'm sorry, these structures may result when legitimate structures fail. So for the urban poor, there are opportunities to make money through hustles such as robbery, burglary, drug dealing, prostitution, pimping, gambling, and other crimes. The hustler is a role model because he or she is one of the few who comes close to the cultural goals of success. White collar crime, which are, which are crimes that people of respectable and high social status commit in the course of their occupations. So white collar crime results from an illegitimate opportunity structure among higher classes. Such crimes exist in greater numbers than commonly perceived and can be very costly, possibly totaling several hundred billion dollars a year. They can involve physical harm and sometimes death. For instance, unsafe working conditions kill about 100,000 Americans each year or about five times the number of people killed by street crime. There have been some recent changes in the nature of crime. A major change is the growing ranks of female offenders. As women have become more involved in the professions and the corporate world, they too have been enticed by illegitimate opportunities. Next, we look at social disorganization theory, which is also uh, part of functionalism. This theory was developed by researchers at the University uh, of Chicago. According to this perspective, uh, crime is most likely to occur in communities with weak, tie weak social ties and the absence of social control, such as good families, good school systems. So therefore, according to them, the social environment influences whether or not a person becomes criminal he or she is not born criminal. In the cultural deviance theory, uh, which uh, also another uh, theory that's part of functionalism, yeah, uh, this, uh, according to this theory, which was uh, developed by researchers Clifford Shaw, Shaw and Henry McKay, uh, conformity to the prevailing culture, uh, he, they argue that there's conformity to the prevailing cultural norms of lower class societies. Uh, this is the conformity. This is what causes crime. Right? So they, uh, how did they find uh, this? How did they study this? Well, they noticed that, uh, so they studied crime patterns in Chicago in the early 1900s. And uh, they looked at uh, how socioeconomic status is correlated with race in the city and uh, within these uh, different racial and economic, socioeconomic classes uh, groups, they create, they have their own smaller society and within each society, they have different ideas of deviance and oftentimes in um, uh, uh, poor uh, communities, uh, there is higher crime rate, and this pattern is um, perpetuated and learned and transferred from one generation to the next generation because uh, crime in these uh, sub society is seen as cultural norm. Uh, and, uh, you know, when a person is born into this sub society, especially the lower class, they conform to it, and then as a result, you know, um, they eventually would engage into in criminal behaviors.
All right, so that is for functionalism. Let's, now let's look at complex theory. Function theorists know that power plays a central role in defining and punishing deviance. They argue that social and economic factors are the causes of crime and deviance. Unlike functionalists, conflict theorists don't see these factors as positive functions of society. They see them as evidence of inequality in the system. So to conflict theorists, the state's machinery of social control represents the interest of the wealthy and powerful. This group determines the laws whose enforcement is essential for maintaining its power. So conflict theory was particularly influenced by Karl Marx's perspective, who we learned in previous chapters already. Uh, he uh, was a German philosopher, economist, and social scientist. Uh, and... Uh, was has been very very important in the ways in which sociologists think about the world. Marx believed that the general population was divided into two groups. He labeled the wealthy the wealthy, who uh, control the means of production and business. He labeled them the bourgeoisie. He labeled the workers who depended on the bourgeoisie for employment and survival the pro pro proletariat. Marx believed that the bourgeoisie centralized their power and influence through government, laws, and other authority agencies in order to maintain and expand their positions of power in society. Though Marx uh, spoke later of deviance, his ideas created the foundation for conflict theorists to stu who studied the intersection of deviance and crime with wealth and power. So Marx definitely influenced uh, C. Wright Mills, who conceptualized and wrote uh, extensively about the power elite. In his book, The Power Elite, uh, C. Wright Mills described the existence of what he dubbed the power elite, a small group of wealthy, influential people at the top of society who hold the power and resources. Uh, wealthy executives, politicians, celebrities, and military leaders often have access to national and international power, and in some cases, their decisions affect everyone in society. Because of this, the rules of society are stacked in favor of a privileged few who manipulate them to stay on top. It is these people who decide what is criminal, what is not, and the effect are often felt most by those who have little power. Mills' theories explain why celebrities such as Chris Brown and Paris Hilton, or once powerful politicians such as Elliot Spitzer and Tom DeLay, can commit crimes and suffer little or no legal retribution. A part of conflict theory includes this perspective on their sector landing intersectionality of crime and social class. According to this perspective, the law is instrument of oppression, a tool de designed uh, to maintain the powerful in privileged positions and keep the powerless from rebelling and overthrowing the social order. When members of the working class get out of line, they're arrested, tried, and imprisoned in the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system directs its energies against violation by the working class, while it tends to overlook the harm done by the owners of corporations, flagrant uh, violations are prosecuted. The publicity given to this level of white-collar crime helps stabilize the system by providing evidence of fairness. An example of how the law and the criminal justice system uh, you know, is somewhat unfair, or, or should I say very unfair, uh, toward the lower class is how there are, uh, is a different punishment for those who use cocaine and crack, which is um, the cocaine is purest form. So, uh, and so uh, cocaine is often used, uh, or it's more expensive and therefore 
uh, used by those who uh, have a little bit more money than those who use crack, which is cheaper and therefore often used by those who have less money or the poor. So the punish for those who use crack is much, much more severe than those who use cocaine, even though both are uh, from the same source. Yep, I've included for you a video about the weather underground in order to show you how uh, you know the government and the power uh, the the power elites um, have so much control and power over our society and they get to decide who what where when is seen as deviant or criminal so just to give you the context the power the weather underground is a group that existed in um, 50s and 60s and they were against the war in Vietnam and they did many things that were seen at that time as deviant and even criminal. Um, but uh, in hindsight, uh, you know, now many decades after the war in Vietnam, uh, in a way, uh, uh, their perspective, their positions against Vietnam is, uh, you know, you know uh, is now understood by many people in American society, but uh, definitely not back then. Uh, back then, they were seen as a criminal. Uh, Okay, so go ahead and take, stop this lecture video so you can watch this YouTube video. Okay, I also included here a trailer of the movie of the 13th, which is a documentary about the criminal justice system in the U.S. throughout its history. It's a very, very good video. I highly recommend you to watch it. Uh, it's, uh, it, in particular, what I like about it is how it discusses not only about the criminal justice system, but how it uh the law intersect with class and race and gender so go ahead and uh if you don't have time i mean watching this trailer is is good in itself okay. all right so now let's go into the third theory uh in uh sociology uh, which is symbolic interactionism or SI. So SI is a theoretical brand approach that can be used to explain how societies and or social groups come to view behaviors as deviant or conventional. So as we already learned from previous chapter, and please review if necessary, SI emphasizes symbols and the meanings that people attach to them. Labeling theory, differential association, social disorganization theory, and social control fall within the realm of symbolic interactionism. So let's first look at labeling theory. Labeling theory is a view that the labels people are given affect their own and others' perceptions of them, thus channeling their behavior either into deviance or into conformity. So label, uh, it's almost like a self-fulfilling um, phenomena where if you label someone a certain way, he or she will, there's a high chance he or she will act accordingly to the label. So, uh, labeling have uh, uh, at least two levels of uh, consequence when it comes to deviance. One is primary deviance. So here in this case, uh, it, uh, you know, the labels does not result in any long-term effects on the individual self-image or interactions with others. But uh, if primary deviance uh, evolve and become secondary deviance, uh, uh, then that can be a little bit more, that can be more serious. Secondary deviance occurs when a person's self-concept and behavior begin to change after his or her actions are labeled as deviant by members of society. The person may begin to take on and fulfill the role of deviant as an act of rebellion against the society that has labeled that individual as such. For example, consider a high school student who often cuts class and gets into fights. The written student is reprimanded frequently by teachers and school staff, and soon enough, he develops a reputation as a troublemaker. As a result, the student starts acting out even more and breaking more rules. He has adopted the troublemaker label and embraces deviant identity. So secondary deviance can be so strong that it bestows 
a master status uh, on an individual. A master status is a label that describes the chief characteristics of an individual. Okay, so uh, sociologists Gresham Sykes and David Matza uh, use the term techniques of neutralization to describe the strategies deviants employ to resist society's labels. These include one, denial of responsibility, which is, uh, uh, could be, an example could be, you know, I didn't do it. A second technique is denial of injury. So this person might say, oh, who really got hurt? No one. A third technique is denial of a victim. So this person who committed the, the demon or criminal act might say, oh, she deserved it. A fourth technique of neutralization is condemnation of the condemner. So this is condemning the person who is uh, condemning the, the person who acted deviantly. So the person who acted, quote, unquote, deviantly might say something like, oh, who are you to talk to? So condemning the condemner. A fifth technique of a neutralization is appeal to higher authority, which, in which the person might say something like, oh, I have to help my, my friends. Okay, here I've included uh, another wire, wire clip for you um, in order to explain to you the labeling theory. Uh, and uh, when you watch this, you'll notice that uh, pay attention to how uh, the adults in this room relate to each other and what kind of labels are used uh, to uh, by the adults as well as the teenagers in this video and notice which label they discuss the most and think about how that impact their life okay All right, and here's a short video to give you an overview of, uh, of labeling theory. Okay, so next, let's discuss differential association theory. Uh, this is, to, uh, is Edwin Sutherland's term to indicate that those who associate with groups oriented toward deviant activities learn an excess of definition of deviance and thus are more likely to engage in deviant activities. The key to differential association is the learning of ideas and attitudes favorable to following the law or breaking it. Some groups teach members to violate norms, such as families involved in crime may set their children on a law-breaking path. Some friends and neighborhoods tend to encourage deviant behavior even subcultures contain particular attitudes of deviant and conformity that are learned by their members. Symbolic interaction is stressed that people are not me mere pawns, so please keep that in mind. So, you know, they are not simply just, a, you know, pawns that are influenced by people and institutions around them because Sociologists recognize that individuals help produce their own orientation to life and their choice of association helps shape the self. Here I've included another wire, uh, the wire cliff to illustrate the differential so association theory. Pay attention to how the characters in this video clip learn to become deviant. Okay, let's look at social and uh, look at control theory. According to this theory, everyone is propelled toward deviance, but a system of control works against these motivations to deviate. Sociologist Walter Reckless uh, described two complementary systems of controls. Inner control uh, or our capacity to withstand temptations toward deviance in internalized morality, integrity, fear of punishment, and desire to be good. Outer controls involve groups such as family, friends, and police. You know, these outer groups influence us not to deviate. 
Travis Hershey uh, noted that strong bonds to society based on attachments, commitment, involvement, beliefs lead to more effective inner control. He identified four types of social bonds that connect people to society. So first, attachment measures are connections to others. When we are closely attached to people, we worry about their opinions of us. People conform to society's norms in order to gain approval and prevent disapproval from family, friends, and romantic partners. Commitment refers to the investments we make in, our, in the community. A well-respected local businesswoman who volunteers at her synagogue and is a member of the neighborhood block organization has more to lose from committing a crime than a woman who doesn't have a career or ties to the community. Similarly, levels of involvement or participation in socially legitimate activities lessen a person's likelihood of deviance. Children who are members of little league baseball teams, for example, have fewer family crises. The final bond, belief, is an agreement on common values in society. If a person views social values as beliefs, he or she will conform to them. An environmentalist, for example, is more likely to pick up trash in a park because a clean environment is a social value to them. Here I've uh, included a very funny video for you uh, to demonstrate control theory. Notice how the main character in this video lost control and uh, what uh, see what happened to him and how you know especially how the the people around him uh, responded to his uh, uh, his deviant behavior. Okay, so here I've included. Uh, a chart just to summarize uh, all the different theories that we discuss and I realize it's quite a lot uh, but they're all very interesting and I, I hope you find them so uh, you know in uh, trying to understand where de and how deviance came come about so so under functionalism you have strain theory uh, developed by Robert Merton here he argues that deviance came from a lack of ways to reach socially accepted goals by accepted methods, such as going to school and work. Social disorganization theory was developed by University of Chicago researchers. Here they argue that deviance arises from weak social ties and a lack of social control. Society has lost the ability to enforce norms with some groups. Third uh, functional theory is a cultural deviance theory developed by Clifford Shaw and Henry McKay, who argue that uh, deviance arises from conformity to the cultural norms of so lower class society. Under conflict theory, uh, you have this idea of unequal equal system developed by Karl Marx, who sees a uh, deviance arises from inequalities in wealth and power that arise from the, the economic system. C. Wright Mills uh, deal this uh, theory of the power elite, and he argued that deviance arises from the ability of those in power to define deviance in ways that maintains the status quo. SI, or symbolic rationalism, you have labeling theory uh, developed by um, Edwin Lemmert, who argues that deviance arises from the reactions of others particularly those in power and who are able to determine labels. Edwin Sutherland developed differential association theory, which argues that learning and modeling deviance uh, seen from other people close to the individual is how one becomes deviant. Walter Reckless and Travis Hershey uh, developed the uh, control theory. They argue that deviance arises from feelings of disconnection from society. All right, so that concludes the second part of our chapter. And we'll stop here before going to a third part of our chapter.